One thing I uh, neglected to mention in the opening prayer request is to remember uh, Sherry and Good and family uh, on the passing of her father uh, this past week in California. Uh, they did say uh, finally that they had gotten the funeral scheduled for January 4th, I believe. Uh, and I think, I haven't confirmed this with them, but I think uh, Gary and Sherry will be traveling out there uh, for that uh, in the coming days. So please remember uh, Sherry and, and her family in your prayers, and also Gary as he recovers uh, from his procedure that he had uh, this past week. So today I will finish up uh, my series of sermons, which uh, I don't know if you can count three as a series, but uh, my third sermon on Christmas at the movies. Uh, you recall we've been taking various uh, Christmas movies uh, and looking at them and, and learning some spiritual application from them. The first one we looked at was a Christmas story. And the lesson there was how we need to be going to our Father in heaven for what we need. Uh, in, in that movie, the little boy went to everybody except for his father, but his father knew what he wanted. And so we need to be going to our Father. Last week, we looked at how the Grinch stole Christmas. And there were a couple of lessons we learned from that, how uh, we always need to be aware of our example. Uh, how the, the Grinch was hurt by people in the movie version. The Grinch was hurt by people who loved Christmas. Sometimes as Christians, people who love Christ, we hurt other people intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, we don't need to follow the example of the Grinch and try to hurt those who hurt us, uh, but we also need to uh, be forgiving and uh, let our hearts grow uh, in Christ, and that was a lesson we got from that. So today we want to finish up in, in this series of Christmas at the Movies by looking at one of my favorites, and that is The Polar Express. Uh, it's a relatively new movie. It came out in 2004. Uh, it was uh, based on the book by Chris Van Allsburg. It was a, a motion capture feature, but uh, again, just to kind of give you a, a quick rundown uh, in case you're not familiar with this particular movie, uh, and if you're not, you need to. Uh, it's, it's a good movie, uh, but it concerns a little boy <clears throat> who is struggling with his belief in Santa Claus. He's getting to that age where, uh, you know, he's starting to see the evidence that maybe Santa Claus is not really real. Uh, and in fact, this is the little boy there uh, from the movie. And uh, on Christmas Eve, he's, he's, you know, struggling with that belief. He's, he's seen the things. He's seen the newspaper article there about, you know, Santa's being on strike. Uh, he's seen the cover of the, the Saturday Evening Post there where the little boy discovers the Santa Claus suit. He goes and he looks in his encyclopedia about the North Pole, and it says it's uh, devoid of life and all this stuff. So he's just really starting to think that there's no such thing as Santa Claus. So he lays down in his bed on Christmas Eve, and then he hears... Uh, the train. This train appears outside in, in the street, basically. Uh, obviously, and it's a, a magic train, and it is the Polar Express on its way to the North Pole. And he meets the conductor uh, who tells him that this is his critical year. He runs down all the things that, that the little boy is kind of struggling with and his doubts there. And so the boy decides to get on the train, obviously, and there's this whole uh, sequence and scene where he meets some other kids on the train, and they travel through some, some time there. But he gets to the North Pole, and he sees the, the city there uh, where Santa Claus has his headquarters, the giant Christmas tree. He sees the elves. He even sees the giant pile of presents uh, that are going to go on the sleigh. And if you've seen the movie, you know that this scene right here, that pile of presents is about 10 or 12 stories high, okay? Huge pile of presents. Uh, they even find one for one of the other little boys on the train there, uh, and it's addressed to Billy. He sees the reindeer uh, with the bells on there, but he doesn't see Santa Claus. In fact, Santa Claus, uh, you know, he, these are all the elves right there, and, and the doors open up, and you can see the silhouette of Santa Claus, and he's, he's straining. The little boy is trying to see him, but other people are in his way. And then he sees one of the bells come off of the, the reindeer, and it bounces over to his feet. And he picks it up, and he shakes it, and it doesn't ring. He can't hear anything. And so finally, confronted with all of this evidence, if you will, that Santa Claus is real, even though he hasn't seen him with his own eyes yet, he makes the statement as he's looking at that bell, he says, okay, I believe. I believe. And then he shakes the bell again, and it rings. And as he's looking at the bell after it rings, he sees the face of Santa Claus appear there behind him in the bell. 
And so he turns around, and of course, there is Santa Claus, and he gives the bell back to him, and he's given the opportunity, the little boy is, to get the first gift of Christmas, and what he asks for is that bell from Santa's sleigh. So he gets back on the train, they go home and everything, and then on Christmas morning, because there was a hole in his pocket and the bell had fallen out, he receives the bell under the Christmas tree from Santa Claus. Now, obviously, <coughs> this is a movie, okay, as all these have been, but there's some lessons there, I think, that we can learn. And the main theme of this movie, if you will, and it's stamped on his ticket right there, is this idea of believing. Belief. Wanting to believe in something. After this boy goes back home, he now believes in Santa Claus. And at the end of the movie, the narrator makes a statement that, um, you know, at one one time, all of his friends could hear the bell ring, but over the years, you know, they began to not hear it. He was the only one out of his friends and family that could still hear the bell ringing, even when he was an adult. <coughs> Struggling to believe, especially when it comes to our faith in God, has always been a problem with mankind, hasn't it? If you go back in, into your Bibles and you look, uh, all the way back in the Old Testament, you see people struggling to believe in the things that God said. Maybe they believed in God, but sometimes they struggled to believe in the things that he said. I think about Sarah and Abraham. When the angels came to them and said that, uh, that they would have a baby, uh, even in their old age, and Sarah overheard this and she laughed. I think that demonstrates some unbelief there. Now, we know that they believed in God. They had already packed up all their belongings and, and left their homeland, traveled to a place, and God said, I'll tell you when you get there, that requires some faith, that requires some belief. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, that's one of the examples that were given there. But here, Sarah, I think, struggled to believe what God said at that point through his messengers, that she would have a child, and so she laughed. You see uh, elsewhere, going forward in, in history there, in the book of Numbers, chapter 14 and verse 11, when the children of Israel had been brought out of slavery in Egypt, and they're camped out there uh, at Mount Sinai, and um, you know, they're doing the things that they're doing there, that they're disbelieving in God, they're disobeying him, and in Numbers 14, 11, the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? God's pointing out here, the same thing that is pointed out to us, is that the evidence is there. It's always been there since the beginning of time, since creation, since God spoke the world into existence. Evidence of his existence has been there and still is there. But people who struggle with their belief, they listen to the naysayers, they have their doubts. And, and understand, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. It's not wrong to have doubts at times, y'all. Okay? Understand that. We'll come back to that in a minute, all right? But people have doubts. They listen to the naysayers. Satan himself even presents us with doubts. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, <coughs> as he's about, or as he's tempting Eve to eat of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now Eve responds by saying, Yes, this is what God said, but I pointed this out before. If you take just what's in the biblical account there, God told Adam not to eat of that tree before he created Eve. So it had to be that Eve got that word from her husband Adam. So Satan's trying to put that doubt in her mind there. Did God really say this? Maybe he's trying to get her to, to, to think it from this way. Did you actually hear God say this? See, he puts the doubt there in her mind. And he does that to us today as well. He whispers those doubts. Maybe not in a, in a physical sense. We don't have the little devil sitting on our shoulder whispering in our ear. But those doubts are there. He puts those doubts in front of us. And sometimes we struggle with our belief. Maybe not so much our belief in God that he exists, but in what he says. Our belief that this is what God wants us to do and this is what we should do and are we going to do it? Open your Bibles if you will, if you've got them, and I hope you do, to the book of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, I'm going to look at a, a passage here, verses 14 through 24, that deals with belief and unbelief. I'm going to read the whole passage here. I was going to just read a couple of verses and I said, well, no, I need to get a little more background. I kept backing up and backing up, so I've got to read the whole passage here so we understand what's going on. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. 
When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, <coughs> have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe help my unbelief. It's that last phrase there that I want to focus on this morning, but here we have uh, Jesus uh, being brought to, to him, this, this boy with this demon, basically. <clears throat> and you'll notice the father says, if you can do anything, help him, please. <clears throat> and Jesus said, if, if you can, all things are possible for one who believe. So he communicates to this father. He had to have some faith. He had to have some belief. And notice the response of this father. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I think this father is expressing what a lot of us express today. We believe in God. We believe in the Bible. We believe the things that, that it teaches us there. But sometimes we have doubts. We know that we don't believe as strongly as we could and should at times. Maybe there are times when we question, well, you know, is this Bible, is this, this printed book right, is this really God's word? <clears throat> or maybe we express it, what if it's not? Did Jesus really come to this earth? Can I believe what's written in the Bible? Can I believe the testimony of those who were there that's recorded? What if it wasn't real? See, those doubts come in. And I believe that's human. I believe that that's okay to have those questions at times. Because like this father here, we believe, but we have some unbelief. Now the word that's used here for believe and elsewhere in Scripture is the Greek word pistuo. And it literally means to be confident in, to be convinced by something. In the movie, and I didn't... Uh, cover this earlier, but in the movie, <clears throat> there's a scene where the little boy's walking up on the roof of the train, and you need to watch the movie to really understand why, okay? But he's walking up on the roof of the train trying to get to the engine, and he runs across this, we'll call him the hobo. And they start having this conversation about the train and where it's going and the North Pole and, and Santa Claus. And the hobo says this to the little boy, he says, what exactly is your persuasion on the big man, speaking of Santa Claus, since you brought him up? <clears throat> And the boy says, well, I, I want to believe, but... And then the hobo says, but you don't want to be bamboozled. You don't want to be led down the primrose path. You don't want to be conned or duped. Have the wool pulled over your eyes. Hoodwinked. You don't want to be taken for a ride. Railroaded. Seeing is believing. Am I right? That's what he says to the little boy. But you see, that's the problem with us sometimes. We think that seeing is believing, and if we can't see it, then we don't believe in it. That was the Apostle Thomas's problem, wasn't it? After Jesus' resurrection, turning your Bibles to John chapter 20. <clears throat> Look at verses 24 through 29. <clears throat> Jesus has appeared to his apostles already after his resurrection, but Thomas was not there. <clears throat> Then we read this passage in John 20, beginning of verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, stop right there, okay? <clears throat> we give Thomas a hard time, okay? But I think Thomas is a lot more like us, or we're a lot more like Thomas than maybe we would like to let on or believe. Okay? Try to put yourself in that situation. 
You've seen Jesus betrayed. You've seen him put on trial. You've seen him beaten and whipped and mocked and that crown of thorns placed on his head. You've seen him taken to that hill and nailed to that cross and die. And his body taken down and put in the tomb. What else are you supposed to think? Now, again, we understand that Jesus had told them he would be resurrected. We know they didn't understand that, just like probably we wouldn't understand it. And so Thomas is not there <coughs> when Jesus appears to them. And so the other apostles come to him, hey, he's, he's resurrected, he's risen. We saw him. Maybe we can understand a little bit better Thomas's doubt, right? No. I saw him die. I saw him go in the tomb. And until I can put my finger in the nail prints in his side, I'm not going to believe it. In other words, Thomas is saying, I've got to see more evidence. I've got to, you know, I've got to see it with my own eyes, basically, is what he says. Keep reading. Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I get it. I understand. Okay? Jesus had told them that he was going to be resurrected. They should have believed him. And Thomas should have believed the word of the other uh, apostles when they had seen him. You know, no, no, no reason for them to lie to him. But he said, I've got to see it with my own eyes until I believe. And Jesus says, I'm glad you believe now, but blessed are those who believed without seeing. <clears throat> but you know what? Sometimes even seeing is not believing. Turn to Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24. Now I think what we just read in John takes place after this, okay? But this was the other apostles, and this is in Luke's account. Luke 24 beginning verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. <clears throat> At this point, they thought Jesus was a ghost. They thought it was his spirit. Again, they had seen him crucified. They had seen him die. They had seen him be put in the tomb. And now here he is appearing to them. And we know in, in, in his flesh, he, he's been resurrected. His body's no longer in the tomb. <clears throat> but they think that's got to be a spirit. It's got to be a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Again, I think by him saying, <clears throat> excuse me, see my hands and my feet, he said, look, it's me. Here's the nail prints. Here's the marks that were made on me when I was crucified. This is me, okay? I've got flesh and bone. I'm not a spirit, okay? And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Verse 41, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. <clears throat> now notice that phrase there, while they disbelieved for joy. It's kind of an odd phrase, isn't it? But if you stop and think about it, it's basically saying they thought it was too good to be true. They're happy, they're glad they're seeing Jesus, but they're so astounded, they're still having trouble believing it. <clears throat> it would be like if, and this is going to be a bad illustration, okay, but it's the best I can do. It'd be like if, if someone told you that someone very close to you died, your spouse or a parent or a child died, okay, and you weren't with them, but you believed that word, okay, you believed that they were dead. And so you, you're traveling to, you know, where, where they live, where the funeral's going to be or whatever, <clears throat> and when you get there... Here they appear to you. And, and, and you realize you know, it was a mistake that was made. They didn't really die. It was miscommunication, but there they are. You'd be so happy. You'd be so overjoyed. But probably for a few moments at least, you'd have trouble believing it, wouldn't you? Because to begin with, you accepted it. You believed that they were dead, and now here they are standing before you alive. And again, I know that's not the, uh, the perfect example here because we know Jesus actually did die and was resurrected. But here they are. In their minds, he's dead. But now he's standing before them. They can't believe it. They're overjoyed, they're happy about it, 
but they're having trouble believing their own eyes. <clears throat> and I think that's why at the end here, Jesus asked them for something to eat, to demonstrate to them, look, I'm not a spirit. I'm flesh and bone. I'm, I'm eating something. Spirits don't eat, okay? Here I am, I'm eating. In all these passages here, we see people struggling to believe. And it took them seeing with their own eyes, in the case of Thomas, uh, in the case of this uh, young boy who uh, was possessed with the demon for him being healed, um, it, it took you know, Jesus eating something for his apostles to, to really begin to accept. They had to see it to believe it. But we go to he Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 1. And we read this very famous verse, very well known now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Like the little boy in the movie, <clears throat> he's struggling for, with his belief in Santa Claus. He sees lots of evidence that Santa Claus is real, at least in the movie. Okay? And before he can lay eyes on Santa Claus, he makes the decision that he's going to believe. He accepts the evidence that he sees. He accepts what his senses are telling him, and he says, I'm going to believe, even without seeing him. That's kind of what Hebrews 11 here is telling us. That faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now I understand <clears throat> we have plenty of evidence that God exists. That he is, that Jesus came to this earth, lived life as a man, was crucified as we've been talking about, was resurrected and, and uh, ascended unto heaven. We have plenty of evidence. We have eyewitness testimony that's been recorded. <clears throat> We have evidence around us in nature that God exists, that he created everything that we see. But none of us have ever seen God in the flesh, have we? We weren't there when Jesus came and, and embodied a human form for 33-odd years and lived life as a man. We weren't uh, like Enoch and others that said they walked with God. We didn't directly communicate with God as the patriarchs did in the Old Testament times. And if you keep reading here in Hebrews chapter 11, <coughs> we're given examples of those who were great persons of faith. Sometimes, even in the face of lots of doubt or even in the face of not knowing the outcome of what they were doing, they still had faith in God. <clears throat> the evidence is there. And like this young little boy in the movie, we simply just have to make the decision to believe that evidence. Are we going to accept what our senses are telling us? Are we going to accept the evidence that's around us and choose to believe? I think we know the answer to that question because we're all sitting here this morning, right? We have chosen to believe in God. We have chosen to believe the testimony written about Him and about Jesus in Scripture. And we have the conviction of things not seen. <clears throat> He made that choice to believe without seeing Santa Claus. But then once he made the choice to believe, Santa appeared, didn't he? And I think the same thing happens with us. Not that God will appear to us once we choose to believe in him, but I think that once we believe in him, it becomes much easier to see the evidence that he is and that he exists. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 25, we read, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Here, I think Paul's talking about that ultimate reward in heaven. None of us have seen heaven. We haven't been there yet. But we're hoping for what we haven't seen yet. But we believe it's there because we have chosen to believe in God. And I think that makes it easier. Now again, that doesn't mean that doubts will never come. That doesn't mean there, there, there won't be times when we won't question our faith, when we won't say, you know, is this really real? <clears throat> and we might need to, again, have the attitude of that father. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's the prayer that we need to have when we struggle with doubt. When we are like Thomas and we say, you know what, I've got to have more evidence. I've got to see something with my own eyes. That's when we pray, Lord, help my unbelief. But you know what, I also think in those times, I think God sends us, not in a miraculous way, but God sends us more evidence. 
He shows us that he is there, that he's taking care of us if we'll simply open our eyes and look and see and make the choice to believe. This morning, if you need to make that choice to believe, to become a Christian, I encourage you to do that. If you've done that in the past and you have wandered away from God, maybe you've had some doubts in your mind. Maybe you've struggled with some things. I encourage you, strengthen your faith. Pray this prayer, help my unbelief. Maybe you're here, you just need prayers for strength and for encouragement to live the Christian life. Whatever your need would be, we invite you to come and respond as together we stand and as we sing.